five games this past week. Somebody that really played well, a home run, one RBI. Yes, sir. Hello and welcome to episode 124 of section 138. I'm your host, Mark Colley, as always, joined by our other hosts, Bryson and Jacob. How are you guys? Well, uh, we got a lot to talk about today, but I'm, uh, I'm doing okay. You know, I'm very interested and very excited to record today for obvious reasons that we'll get into, but overall I'm doing okay. Jay's in a road trip at four and two, so it could have been worse, but it was definitely a good step forward. It's going to be an action-packed episode i can already tell that but yeah they took two of three from the yankees then they take two of three from cleveland which charlie montoyo seemed very proud of that fact um they won 11 to 2 in a rain-soaked seven inning game on friday off day on saturday with game being postponed and then sunday yesterday they have the double header they take the first one four to one they lose the second one six to five and that's what we're going to be talking about mostly today but jacob how are you well, I mean, you just listed all that. So, I mean, I'm not doing too well considering that. But a little stat for people, Blue Jays played five seven-inning games in a row considering all the rainouts and whatnot, which, you know, that's kind of funny. They've played so many less innings than yeah. they should have. Good for the bullpen, but it wasn't good enough, I guess. But, well, we'll, yeah, we'll get into first, that. They're actually the first team in Major League history to play five consecutive seven-inning games. And the second team is going to be Cleveland, which I think is going to do it today because they have – either doubleheader today or tomorrow so today yeah it's it's a crazy time to be a baseball fan especially for the Blue Jays but yeah so just jumping right into it yesterday's game the Blue Jays up four to zero going into the later innings bring in Tyler Chatwood in the seventh he walks the bases loaded walks in a run to make it five to five finally Charlie Montoyo brings in Anthony Castro out of the bullpen Castro does his job he gets a sack fly but that ends the game it walks it off for Cleveland um, there was no one warming in the bullpen before that Charlie Montoyo couldn't have taken out Tyler Chatwood after he walked in um, after he walked three straight because there's no one warming in the bullpen this move got I think probably like the most criticism I've ever seen against a Blue Jay manager in the time that I've been a fan. It's been pretty crazy the amount of criticism that's been leveled onto Montoyo. And he had a lot to say about it after the game, but I'll just play the clip from what he did say, which is pretty interesting. And I'm sure there's going to be a lot to unpack there. Being lights out, you know, the funny thing about it, we're talking about just the one game. We took two other three from the Yankees, two other three from these guys. And we're talking about one bad inning. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, maybe we could have taken him out. Yeah, all that stuff. But he's one of our best relievers. He, we, you got to trust somebody one time and, you know, let, let him get out of trouble. But, again, it was a great road trip. We did an outstanding job. Two out of three, two out of three. Doesn't get any better than that. Of course, we could have swept. If we, you know, we got one more out, one, three more outs, but didn't work out that way. So lots to unpack there. So what are your guys' thoughts about this? The other people are lot, lots of people are critical of the other moves Montoyo made, removing Stripling from the game early, using up Rafael Dolis and Jordan Romano in the first game. Personally, I only blame Montoyo for the decision not to warm anyone up in the bullpen in that seventh inning with Tyler Chatwood on the mound. That's where I stand. We're going to get into more of that later. But what do you blame Charlie Montoyo for? What are your thoughts on this whole situation? I blame him for both. I'm not going to lie. I said to you guys in our group chat. Rafael Delis and Jordan Romano should not have both been used in that first game against Cleveland. Now I understand, okay, it was a safe situation and they haven't worked a lot, but you're playing literally in one hour. Worst case, I think you, you plan to save one of them for the second game. And I know you guys brought up the point, well, what if it's a 10 to two game? And okay, fair enough. I, I th that is a good point, but I would still give one of them work. I don't care who it is. Jordan Romano, maybe, okay, maybe you put him in the safe situation because it was a safe situation and you keep Dolis. But either way, I think that is a bad decision, especially considering Stripling only had thrown and was around 70 pitches. It was less than 80. So he could have at least given you one more inning, maybe even the full game, although that's probably unlikely. And I don't think I would have done that. But I hated the move with Tyler Chatwood. I'm not going to lie that also I, I blame him completely for that. Well, actually I shouldn't say completely. I blame both Tyler Chatwood and Charlie Montoyo because here's the thing in Charlie in Tyler Chatwood's last three and a thirds innings, he's walked nine batters. And considering he was one of the Blue Jays best relievers for pretty much the entire season, that is 
atrocious. And and you look at the game against the Rays, that one where they lost because of I think it was four walks in the last inning or something. That was on Tyler Chatwood, and he was he was very angry that he was called out and he, or taken out, but he did it again, unfortunately, and the Blue Jays ended up losing. I do think it was also on Charlie Montoyo, though. I mean, again, I think this goes back to the point with Dolis and Romano. Save one of them and then have one of them warming up in the ninth inning at the basically if something goes wrong so that they can come out and something did go wrong. Anthony Castro had to come out. Unfortunately, he the run wasn't charged to him because it wasn't his man on base, but he was on the mound when the last run came in. So I don't blame him. It, it, he was put into an absolutely terrible situation, but uh, I don't know how Charlie Montoyo doesn't have somebody warming up literally anybody. I, I like the thing is, is even if Tyler Chatwood doesn't struggle or it, it, the second you notice that he's struggling, you warm somebody up because realistically, like you, you have an off day, I think everybody should be available, even if they pitched previously in the game earlier. But considering that Charlie Montoyo trusted Tyler Chatwood, which, okay, fair enough. I do understand that. But considering that he trusted him even after he was showing that he didn't have it, it just, it, it boggles my mind. And this is another game that the Blue Jays ended up losing because of a bit of a combination of mismanagement and some uh, lackluster performances. Yeah, see, I'm with you on some of it. And then um, some other parts, I'm not totally with you. I think me and Mark are more on the same page based on what I saw in our chat yesterday, unless I'm wrong, but Mark's going to speak anyway in a bit. So you can correct me if I, if I'm wrong, but anyways, here, here's the deal, because I guess we're, we're going to go right into what happened yesterday and uh, we're going to start with the first game of the doubleheader. So Jacob, you were saying how you disagreed with Dolis and Romano, right? And to the, a point of it, I can understand that, but I just, for me, like if I'm the manager, I'm just planning one game at a time because I, it's really impossible to predict uh, what's going to happen. And if you're going to say, okay, use this guy for game two, for sure. You know, I just don't like the idea of planning ahead when you want, when I want to plan one game at a time, because every scenario for me is different. And a lot of people were saying yesterday too, from what I've been seeing all over social media is that, well, people uh, complain about so-and-so being left in the game too long. And then all of a sudden people have a problem with it, but everything is different and every situation is different. And the part where I disagree with Charlie Montoyo is the fact that there was nobody warming up. And I think pretty much hundred percent of Blue Jays fans also disagree with that. But the part where I don't fault him for is the fact that he tried Tyler Chatwood because I have no problem with Tyler Chatwood coming into the game. I don't. However, when you don't have it, because we see it, we, we know you, you know, right away, if somebody is on or not, when you walk five batters in an inning and a third, like, I don't know what other indication that gives you that he does not have it. And the fact that it took Montoyo, what, two or three walks in to finally get Anthony Castro going up, it was already too late. It was way too late. He should have been yanked earlier. And the part where I have a problem with this post-game press conference is, and Mark, you, you nailed it right on uh, top, so I'll give you credit for it, is not only does he acknowledge some of it, but a lot of it he also dodges because he does. He refers that they took two out of three from the Yankees, two out of three from Cleveland. But the, the, of course he's right. And of course it was, I guess, the end of a, a somewhat successful road trip because they did finish four and two. Uh, it, it's just a lot of winnable games that are thrown out the window. And it's not the only time this year where this has happened. It's been a different scenario each time. And a lot of people are saying this team could be so much better on paper based on the record if Montoyo just did things differently. And with Tyler Chatwood, because I do agree with him, and a lot of us do agree, is that he has been one of the best relievers in this bullpen this year. And there's no faulting that. Obviously, the past week, it's been a nightmare for him. His ERA is up to 310 now. Before that, it was below one, I think, at for a certain point. It was just around one. And I don't disagree with him being sent out in the eighth inning, or sorry, the seventh inning. I really don't. But he should have been yanked earlier, and there should have been a guy warming up regardless. And then, of course, you throw in Anthony Cashel with the bases loaded with, what was it, one out. You know, there's not really much you can do, and you kind of had an idea that the game was over. It was a sack fly, and, you know, there's nothing really Cashel could have done because it was obviously a well-executed pitch. But it was the scenario that he came in. It was too late. And the bullpen management, again, it's just something where Charlie Montoya has been criticized for it all year. And yesterday was another prime example. And you can tell, too, in the post-game interview is that he knew the heat was on him because he was very defensive of why he did it and why not. But the fact of the matter is, I understand that Tyler Chatwood has been the guy, but he just didn't have it. And that's OK. Not everyone is going to have it out of the bullpen every day, which is why you need to, and especially for a team that's trying to make the playoffs. We've said this time and time again. You need to be pulling guys out of the game earlier and you can't be leaving them in. 
And yesterday, Tyler Chatwood was hung up to dry. He had five walks, inning and a third. He didn't have it. And unfortunately, it costed the Jays the win. And the other thing that was frustrating is that they were leading 4 nothing in the sixth inning. This was a game that they should have won easily. It's not like it was back and forth. They were up 4 nothing. They gave up a four spot in the sixth inning. And we saw something similar in that Rays series last week. They gave up four runs in one inning because the Rays did the exact same thing. One of the games in the ninth inning, they let it slip away through their fingers and you look back at it and you may look back at it two or three months down the road and say all of these games, because this has been a rough couple of weeks all together, all of these games that they let away from them. And it's just winnable games that don't unfortunately pay off and it, and it, and it affects your sta- your part of the standings and it affects your record. So that's why, in a way, I agree with Charlie Montoyo for trying out Chatwood. He should have been yanked earlier. When it goes back to your point, Jacob, I'm fine with Dolis Romano really in one game because that is your one-two punch when you're heading late in the innings. And, you know, the other thing too is I know Romano said he was good to go if they wanted to go to him again. Maybe he could have, should he have came in? If I'm the manager, absolutely. But we all know that's not going to happen under this regime or modern day baseball with the or work ethic and all of that. So I really had no expectation that Romano was going to come in for a second straight game in what an hour so that's the that's where I look at it I want to plan one game at a time every scenario is different which is why I don't criticize his use of the bullpen in game one game two however I think he did go to the right guy and he had no reason not to go to the right guy but there should have been something done a lot earlier and unfortunately it costed the Jays the win yeah and like the thing with the reason I don't disagree with the move to go with Delise and Romano in the first game is that you bring in Chatwood in game two. He has to get work. He has to figure it out eventually. You have a three-run lead. Uh, you know, whatever. Bring him in. It's fine. But, you know, bringing in Jordan Romano with the bases loaded, with the game tied in the ninth inning against a guy who doesn't strike out in Jose Ramirez, I don't care who it is. You could bring in a Roldis Chapman in that situation, and there's a fair odds that he's going to screw it up and the Cleveland is going to walk it off. Like, you can bring in Jeremy Beasley. You can bring in a Aroldis Chapman. You, I don't care who it is. It's a situation where the reliever has to do something miraculous to get out of it. It's not the fact that the Blue Jays didn't have the arms in their bullpen to get out of that. It's just there was no one warming up. So that's what I'm upset with. And, yeah, like you said, play one game at a time. You've got to get these guys work. These are guys who have barely pitched over the last week because, we, like we said, five consecutive set, seven-inning games. The Blue Jays will play their first nine-inning game in a week tomorrow night. So, like, you you got to get these guys in. You don't know what's going to happen in the second game. You look at the first game, okay, maybe they don't go with those guys. Maybe they go with Tyler Chatwood in the first game instead. You only have a three-run lead, right? So if you screw it up then instead of in the second game, people are going to be complaining about that. So that's why I don't disagree with that. And when it comes to Ross Stripling, okay, leave him in. Then the same thing that happened with Steven Matz is going to happen with Ross Stripling. They left Steven Matz in. He ended up getting charged with four and runs. So to me, like that's you can play what if this happened, coulda, woulda, shoulda, different situations. You can game out the chessboard to see what would have happened. But bottom line, those moves are moves that, you know, I, I don't disagree with. That's not why the Blue Jays lost the game. The Blue Jays lost the game because there was no one warming up in the bullpen to come in for Tyler Chatwood after he had walked three straight batters. That's it. Like, that's the the meat and potatoes of this issue for me. And that's why it's so frustrating. So I want to ask you guys, like, why do you think no one was warming up? Like, I really have no idea why no one was warming up in the bullpen at that point. Because, like, if this had happened – a week ago, I would understand, right? The Blue Jays a week ago, the bullpen was running on fumes. There was no one available in any situation practically because it was so overworked. So if this was happening a week ago, totally understand, right? You have to leave a guy in because you don't want to go to the bullpen. You don't want to exhaust the bullpen even more. They've had five consecutive seven inning games. <laughs> like there are so many guys who haven't pitched in a week that you can go to I don't understand why no one was warming up. Some people are saying maybe it was tough love from Charlie Montoya, right? Tyler Chatwood, he threw a hissy fit last time he took was taken out of the game. Okay, you learn your lesson. I'm going to make you lose this game, and you're going to learn a lesson here. So some people saying that's the reason why. In some respects, I think that's worse, purposely losing a game to teach a player a lesson than just you know having a brain fart and not warming anyone up in the bullpen. In some respects, I think that's worse. Why was no one warming up? Do you guys have any ideas of why no one was warming up in the bullpen at that time? 
Well, I'll tell you what, if, if it truly was tough love, then Charlie Montoyo needs to be fired right now because you, I understand teaching players a lesson, but when you're costing your entire team a game, that is, that's inexcusable the way I see it. And the AL East, it's very tight. I mean, the Blue Jays at one point, they were half a game back. And I think the top four teams were within two and a half games. You cannot afford to lose games intentionally. I mean, that in itself is just a load of garbage if that's truly what it is. But in terms of Tyler Chatwood, I think Charlie Montoyo did does trust him and justifiably so going into the Tampa Bay Rays series that he played two games in there. That first game, he had a uh, 0.53 ERA. So he was good. And that was the first uh, outing where he, or when I mentioned earlier, he had nine walks and three and a third. That was the start of it. So coming into that series, he was very good and had been good all season long. So I understand trusting him. And even in that appearance, I think he only had one walk. So it's really just been his last two outings that he's been bad. So I understand trusting one of your best relievers, but you got to watch the game. And if your best reliever is not your best reliever, okay, take him out. I, I just, I don't understand how you can almost air him out to dry or hang him out, hang him out to dry because you cannot afford to lose games. And I keep saying that, but that that's just how it is. And we go back maybe in at the end of the season and the blue Jays are out by of, of the playoffs by a game or two, you can look back and say, well, what about these games that were not taken as seriously as they should? And that's just, it's mind boggling to me. And especially to your point, Mark, the fact that the bullpen has been not as overworked as it normally has been. They've only played uh, whatever it is. I think 35 innings when they should have played like 10 more or something like that. Like this bullpen has not pitched a lot in the last week. So all hands should be on deck and you should have the guys available even if you like, I know we mentioned Dolis Romano, even if one of them does want to go out a second time, I would have let them, but Charlie's obviously not going to do that. But the fact that nobody was warming up is just, it makes me more angrier than if somebody was warming up. Cause okay. Say Anthony Castro comes in two batters before and he allows two earned runs and the blue Jays end up losing. Okay. Fair enough. Then whatever. But the fact that nobody was warming up and that, somebody then had to come into an absolute mess of a situation. It just, it makes me very angry. And it's just the way that this was handled. It just, uh, Char- look, I- I've been defending Charlie Montoyo for quite a while, but I cannot defend this. And I understand why the pitchforks were at him. And he, he was angry in that interview. People, I think it was uh, whoever it was. I don't remember off the top of my head, whoever's voice it was that asked him the question. He was angry about it. it he knows that the, the heat's on him and, He's got to defend it. And I, I really don't know how you defend it other than by going and managing your butt off in the month of June, because you got to come back from a terrible month after that. That's just, that's not excusable. And that's not excusable for any team, but especially considering you're supposed to make the playoffs that you can't have that happen. You can't throw games. You can't mismanage this many games going back even to last season. There were so many instances of well, this should have been done differently. And yes, I understand hindsight is twenty twenty, and you can say, of course, like this should have been done differently, but you got to learn from your mistakes. You can't just continuously say, well, we'll learn from that or yeah, I should have done that differently. Like bottom line is, is Charlie Montoyo is mismanaging this game or mismanage that game. Somebody should have been warming up. And I, I can't like, I can under, I can be frustrated about a bad performance, but I'm even more frustrated that a bad performance was let was prolonged basically that point that you got to read the game you got to take guys out when they're not doing well and charlie just didn't do that and it hurts my head yeah and you're you're saying june is going to be a, another tough month for the blue jays and this is something where it's getting harder for them as you look at it now they're currently fourth in the al east there's six games behind tampa bay and tampa bay as we saw last week the rays are on fire. They've won 15 out of their last 16. They're 34 and 20. And of course the Jays have Boston and New York was well ahead of them. So things aren't exactly easier for, or will get easy for the Jays. It's going to get very difficult. And um, unfortunately we're, we've been seeing the effects over the last 10 days. And quickly, I just wanted to talk about Tyler Chatwood his last seven days, a 675 ERA, a whip of three. And actually there was a funny uh, stat calculated last night and it was Tyler Chatwood's strike percentage today. 22%. So going back to yesterday, 22% was the lowest of any major league baseball player since 1988 when pitches were first tracked. Lowest strikeout percentage since 1988. And um, it's it was at 22%. So just to show how bad of a week it has been for Tyler Chatwood, that's a pretty remarkable stat right there. And I mean, I go I back to it. He was on a, a minimum of 30 pitches in an outing yeah. as well. 
exactly. And when I go back to it, if you don't have it, you don't have it. Tar- Charlie Montoya has to keep that in his mind that he has not been good recently. Why are you leaving him in like that? And going back to your, your question, Mark, about the tough love thing and Jacob too, like if that's truly the case, it's very petty. And it's, I just, I have a hard time believing that is, but if it is, it's just, it's childish. Like, what do you want him to like, be happy that he's getting pulled out of the game. You want him to be angry. We see it all the time. Remember that video of Steven Matz a month ago when he was slamming the dugout in Oakland, what do you want him to do? Be all happy that he got pulled out of the game and gave up what four or five runs. Like you should want him to be mad. And if, if you're going to do that and leave him in the game because of that, that's it's childish. And there's, there's no way that's true. And if it is, I, I would have nothing to say about that, but about why nobody was warming up. I just, I mean, I, I listened to his interview yesterday and the one thing about what I've noticed with Montoya is I don't think he really lies to the media as much as we see with other guys in the Jays front office. I think what you hear from him is what he's truly feeling. And I think yesterday too, the, his emotion, how angry or not angry, just how defensive he got. I think he truly just wanted to leave Tyler Chatwood into the game. I really think he didn't really think much about it, to be honest with you. I really don't think so. I mean, you leave him out, he walks three guys and then you, then you get the bullpen up. Like I, other than that, there's, maybe it was a brain fart. Like I just, I have no answer because other than I just believe what he said in his interview that he truly believes since he's been one of their best relievers all year, he's been in a funk, let him work through it. Probably not smart when you're leading by one run and in, in extra innings or not even extra innings in the seventh inning, the final inning of the game, probably not the opportunity for that, but I just think they have a, a, had a completely different mindset. And unfortunately this really came back to bite them. And I, I mean, you guys covered it really well as well. I just don't know what else to say. It's just, it's disappointing. I understand they went forward. They went four and two on the road trip. Overall, the last 10 games, the Jays have gone four and six. So still over the last 10 games, it hasn't been the greatest. I know the run differential is still up there, still one of the highest, at least for a fourth place team in baseball. I believe they are, or if, if not, they are. So on the, on the bright side, there's still some signs that are pointing towards it being good and getting better. I mean, we didn't really get into the starters either from yesterday. I thought Ross Stripling was remarkable once again. That's two straight starts now, or not even. I guess the other one, it was an appearance. He was the, he came out as the bulk guy. Two, two um, outings now where he's looked really well after kind of like a mechanical change to his windup. That's definitely very optimistic. And, of course, we had Ryu on the first game of the series in a cold, cold night in Cleveland. I kind of give him a pass for that as much as he wasn't a sharp. It kind of seemed hard for everyone to get in the game for that. So, the stars, on the other hand, seemed like they were doing okay and do- doing pretty well, and that's something that uh, is obviously good for this team. Marcus Semyon's another guy who I had highlighted three for three in game one yesterday, and OPS now up over 900, and even in the second game, he went one for three. 915 in OPS, 297 batting average. He's been leading the way these past few games as well, so that's somebody that I had circled. Of course, Teoscar Hernandez had a good series as well. So all in all, things are not great right now. We know that but there's still some signs of life and there's still some signs that this thing can get turned around. And maybe this move to Buffalo as we, we know they begin play there Tuesday, tomorrow night, maybe things start to go well. And maybe this month of June really goes the opposite way. And that way would be up and not down from what we saw this last week of May. Well, also with Ryu, I just want to point out, he, he started off actually pretty, it was pretty rough for him. I think he had the bases loaded twice in that first inning against Cleveland, Mm -hmm. but after that, he threw four shutout innings. So it was just, it, Impressive. yeah, the, the situation, it was obviously, it was terrible. Guys were slipping everywhere. So uh, like you said, I'll give him a pass. It was, he had really one bad inning and, and like one bad inning out of how, I don't even know how many he's thrown, but one bad inning out of 10 starts. So I'll give him a pass. He he's, he's still their ace and he, he proved that he can settle down. And the thing for that start with me is when he was struggling in the first inning, what happened? Joel Piamps was warming in the bullpen. Like, it's just, for me, it's the, I know, I just so want to go back to, I'm so upset, but it's the ABCs of baseball. Yeah. It's like, if a pitcher is struggling, you warm someone up in the bullpen. It doesn't cost you anything. It's not like you're not going to be able to use this guy because he's been warming up in the bullpen. It's the ABCs of baseball. I don't know if, I don't care if you're Hinge and Ryu. I don't care if you're Garrett Cole or if you're Corbin Burns or like whoever you are. If you're struggling, you have someone warming up in the bullpen. This was the first inning of one of the best pitchers in baseball who was just struggling a tiny bit. He wasn't even doing that bad. He didn't give up too much hard contact. And they had someone warming in the bullpen. But you have Tyler Chatwood on the wand who on the mound, who's now walked 10 guys in the last week. And he had the lowest strike percentage of any pitcher in an appearance of 30 or more pitches since 1988 when this first started being tracked. And you don't have someone warming in the bullpen. It just, 
it boggles my mind. I really have no idea. Like I, <laughs> like your guys' guess is as good as mine. I have no idea why no one was warming. And Bryson, I think you might be right. I think Montoyo may just have had trust in Chatwood. Like he may just have wanted to see Chatwood succeed. We know Montoyo is a very positive person, which all credit to him. He may have really just thought Chatwood could succeed. And I'm sure there's going to be conversations between him and Ross Atkins and Mark Shapiro. And of course, with Pete Walker. And another thing to mention is we do blame this all on Montoyo. Pete Walker was sitting right next to him. Perhaps some of the blame should go to Pete Walker, but I just, I don't know. It boggles my mind. And like, I'm someone, like you said, Jacob, I'm someone who generally agrees with Charlie Montoyo. I like my mindset on him has changed a lot since the start of last season. And I do defend a lot of the stuff that he does. And I still think he's a good manager. He's a good person. Like he seems like a good fit for the Blue Jays. And I don't think he should be fired. But this move definitely made me question that. (laughs) It definitely made me question that because it just, it boggled my mind. I know it's one thing. It's one game. It just, it confuses me. But yeah, so to end this conversation with that, like, do you guys think Charlie Montoya should be fired? Or at least are you closer to that point than you were when I asked that question I guess it was a week ago now I'm glad that we recorded or recording this on the off day and not right after the game because I was a little uh, I was very angry after that game so after giving it I guess 15 18 hours I first of all Charlie Montoya was not getting fired this season he's staying with the Blue Jays till the end of the season that's not changing after the season I will, well, I mean, we'll have to see how the rest of the season plays out. I still, if I had to give it a percentage chance, I would give it an, under a 15%, maybe 10%. I don't think it's very likely if he continues with what's been going on, then you, you got to entertain that because that you, like we've said, you cannot have a playoff team or a team that's supposed to make the playoffs and trying to make the playoffs give away games and mismanage games. So I, I don't think it's, it, if it will happen, it'll happen in the off season. And I still don't think it's very likely at this point, this, the rest of the season could pan out and, and basically confirm that he's getting fired, but I think we'll have to still give him a, a bit of chance to defend himself. Yeah. I don't know if my chances really go up since the last time we asked, I, I still think it's relatively low. I know they went, they exercised their, his team option for next year already in the spring. So obviously that doesn't really mean anything. They can still at the end of the year fire him, I guess. It doesn't really change anything. I just think they're still committed to him and he's still somewhat showing results. He has, I mean, he's still an optimistic guy. He said, look, we're, we're talking about one game. We took two to three from the Yankees, two to three from Cleveland. And uh, we pretty much just focus on this one last inning, but it's just costly. A lot of people are saying what this team's record would be if not of some of the mistakes he's made or some of the decisions that he's been criticized for. So I don't look into it that much. I mean, maybe there are a few games better. I mean, especially after yesterday, I still think yesterday was such a winnable game. And that's that race series too. Like just the last week overall, definitely a few games they maybe could have had even before that in the Boston series too. There's definitely a lot of games they let slip away, but a lot of people are wondering what the record would be. And it's funny because he was trending obviously on Twitter and a lot of people were also getting John Gibbons trending. I'm sure you guys saw that too. So very interesting. A lot of people saying they miss Gibby, but I feel like Gibby got a lot of hate too when he was here. So obviously everyone needs a scapegoat, but I just found that kind of ironic how both of them are trending at the same time. Yeah, the grass is always greener on the other side of the, whatever the saying is. There's different endings to the saying. My favorite ending is the other side of the septic tank, but... <laughs> Yeah, it's always it's always greener on the other side. John Gibbons has had his fair share of criticism, and now people want him back, but whatever. Yeah, like, Charlie Montoya has done a good job, and I know I'm someone who defends him, but I think he does do a good job, and I don't blame him for the mistakes he made last week because the bullpen was exhausted. It was running on fumes. You can't blame him for not having the tools to win, and that was last week. This week, today, yeah. Yesterday, he had the tools to win and he just didn't and I, that's where I draw the line and that's why I'm really upset again shouldn't be fired doing a good job the Blue Jays went 15 and 13 in May despite all the injuries despite having the, an exhausted bullpen despite having a rotation that um, hasn't really gone deep into games at all until the last week despite not having George Springer despite all these different factors Kevin Biggio now on the IL 
They went 15 and 13. They started out the month three and three and a half games back from the division lead. They're six games back now only because of the, how good the rest of the division has been, specifically the Tampa Bay Rays. But he's doing a good job. It's just stuff like this is infuriating. And it definitely, if my mark of how likely it is he's fired before the end of the season, I think before yesterday, it was probably like 0.5%. I think after yesterday, probably ticks up to like 3% which isn't like a significant difference. It's obviously still incredibly low and I don't think it'll happen, but I think it it's definitely a knock against him and makes it a little bit more likely. I think it's just, it's the thing that we need to now look at for the rest of the season because one bad appearance or one bad uh, game is not going to make or break his career, but consistently making these decisions that make us scratch our heads will, I think, be the end of it. And I like that you mentioned that there has there hasn't been necessarily all the blame that should be going on him like the obviously the rotation was not going deep in they only had I think two starters at one point for a couple uh, turns in the rotation injuries are just plaguing this team so there's not there's not as much that you can pinpoint and say that this is the manager's fault but now as we're starting to see things turn around there are I think things that you can look at and say well should have been done differently and even go back to last season pitchforks were out for him at times for some reason but yeah this is it'll be an interesting thing to look at as the season progresses we're only it's tomorrow's june the first so we have about four months left of baseball to play and if the blue jays make the playoffs we'll see how people react if they don't or how they treat charlie montoyo if they don't and the managing is one of the reasons it'll be very interesting to see if he is kept on the roster and i mean like realistically he probably will be but there are a lot of people on Twitter that are making themselves very vocal and and very present about how they're angry. And even uh, it was funny. One of uh, our episode, I think on titled should the blue Jays uh, fire Charlie Montoyo. I kept getting notifications about how that was getting more views and comments and people were very angry about that. So it's, this is something that people are very, very angry about and justifiably, but he's going to need to turn it around. I think he will like, honestly I don't I don't plan or I don't hope that he struggles and continues to struggle as a manager but he's gonna need to turn it around especially considering that there's a lot of vocal people that are very angry about him well yeah the goal for June is to obviously play better than 15 and 13 you got to start making a push we know the rest of the AL East has doing that has been doing that obviously another step or another goal is to start start to get healthy Hopefully by the end or middle of the month, you see George Springer, middle to the end of the month, sorry, you see George Springer come back as well as other guys for the bullpen. And they have an opportunity to present themselves a few times this month. We know that they have, um, what is it, a three, five game homestand coming up first in Buffalo. They have Miami. We know Miami isn't as good as last year. They're kind of, I think they're four games below 500 right now. So you have them four times, you got them twice, and you got them twice in Miami later in the month. You've got Baltimore for two series as well. You got Seattle. And then, of course, you got a couple challenges too. You got the Yankees one time, you got Boston one time, and then you've got the White Sox and you've got the Astros. So, those are, it's going to be a little bit more of a balanced month for sure on paper, but definitely a chance for the Jays to, I guess, run the table and start making the push. Cause I would have liked, and I'm sure all of us would have liked that push to start in May. However, they still are in it based off the standings, even though they're six games back right now, but it's definitely going to get a little bit more balanced going down going down the road here. So a few series this with uh, Miami with Baltimore, Seattle for you to take advantage of, but definitely some good matchups as well this month coming along the way for this team. So we really uh, will have to see how June plays out. This is definitely going to be a big month. Yeah. We'll wait and see Charlie Montoya, certainly a flashpoint for blue Jay fans. And it's weird because he's such, he, at least to me, he seems like such a likable guy. It's just, yeah, like the there's night before, this, he he stopped, you exactly. know, he, we saw with the computer <laughs> watching his son graduate. Like, he's, yeah, he's a good per. like he means all in all. And that's why I have a hard time criticizing him because I know how much of a good person. I'm sure he's well liked around the clubhouse and the organization, too. So obviously a few hiccups. He's still learning, but we obviously we, we got to it's got to stop. We got to start going forward here and start winning games and not blowing games. Yeah, it's funny how quickly things can change. One night he's all around baseball, right? Like John Boy posted a video of that and everyone loves him. And then the next day this happens. Anyway, so let's talk. You mentioned this a little bit earlier, Bryson, but Marcus Simeon, uh, we should talk about him because they were talking on the broadcast yesterday about how he's probably a favorite or at least one of the favorites to win AL Player of the Month just because of how good a month 
he had. You look at the numbers about where he ranks in offensive categories. In wins above replacement, he has 2.3. He's first in war in the month of May in the American League. He ranks first in batting average with 368, third in on-base percentage at 429. He's first in slugging at 702. He's third in runs scored with 23. He's third with home runs at eight. I mean, those are just incredible numbers. Like, there's no way to deny that. After the slow start to the season he had, he's now on pace for a 41 home run season, 100 RBI, 106 runs scored, 38 stole, uh, 38 sec, excuse me, 38 doubles, 25 stolen bases, and a slash line of 297, 365, 550, on pace for nine baseball reference war, 8.4 fan graphs war. Just like video game numbers, incredible, incredible numbers for Marcus Simeon. After the slow start of the season he had, we could be seeing him become AL player of the month. It's, I, I don't know how much there is to talk about here. It's just, it's incredible. Well, he and Vladdy have both been very good, but one of the things I'm not going to try and regurgitate because there's only so much you can say. Marcus Simeon is, uh, he's playing at like Greek God level uh, right now. But I think one thing that I've heard people ask me is what do you think the chances are the Blue Jays keep Simeon beyond this season now I said to them I don't think it's very likely considering the prospects they have and after a month like this if if Simeon even is remotely similar to that he can demand 25 million maybe at least and I don't know if the Blue Jays would pay him that but yeah basically Marcus Simeon's been fantastic and if the Blue Jays do it so first of all I don't think it's likely he comes back but if they were to keep him beyond this season he would he'd be very good for the team uh, but I'm not going to say too much on that i don't think it's likely but yeah this is just he's been one of the one of the bright spots really the entire month and even when springer comes back all these types of guys like biggio and you know as as guriel starting to come around with his his batting average is starting to go up i think this lineup is even deeper than it, it looks on paper and if simeon's able to continue this i don't know how you move him down to the order because i mean springer likely is your your leadoff hitter, maybe your second hitter, but then you move Bichette and Guerrero down. And I don't know if that's the most likely case, but I think you keep Simeon in the leadoff spot, even when Springer comes back. And he's just, he's been crazy. OPS almost at a thousand. I mean, like, the, like you said, Mark, that this is just, it's, it's amazing. And I don't know how, well, I don't know how he did it, honestly. Like, especially, you know, he started off pretty slow hitting under 200 for, for quite a while, but yeah, it's fantastic what he's doing. And him and Teoscar Hernandez too. I think there was a stat that just came out. He has hit 44 home runs in his last 162 games combined. So a lot of bright spots in this lineup. And honestly, if, if those things that we talked about earlier are, are starting to fix themselves and you're starting to see better managing, better pitching, this team easily could win the world series. And that's why it's just, it's so frustrating seeing them lose games that they should win. Cause they have the guys that really could take them. And, Simeon's one of them, especially considering he's just, he's on a one-year deal. He's out to prove himself, especially after a bit of a down year last year, but I'm excited to see what he's able to do for the month of June. And if he's able to at least maybe hit 270, 280, something like that, then I would consider that a, a fantastic first half of the season. Yeah. And uh, Jacob, I give you credit. You're still on board with that world series prediction. So I, a prediction. So I give it to you. I, I do, but yeah, Marcus Simeon, what a month of May. And really the only one on the active roster too, when you look at it in the month of May to have an OPS over 1100. I mean, it's crazy how good he played an average of 368 and uh, on base percentage of 429. So, so this guy was doing pretty much everything. And uh, I just, I was completely blown away with the turnaround he's had now where he fits in the lineup when George Springer comes back. That's obviously a discussion to have for when Springer is going to come back. We'll hopefully, like I said earlier, middle to the end of the month, but yeah, his hard hit percentage as well was at 45% this season. And that's uh, pretty much top five or top three in uh, on the current roster as well. So he's been hitting hard balls all year and um, obviously a slow start, but this is the gamble. Jacob, you mentioned it just now. I'm not going to repeat yet. And it's paying off. We know, we know the 2019 he had, the 2020 was a down year. The Jays took a gamble. And I do find that an interesting question. I was actually going to ask you guys too, is, you know, if he does test the market, I, I've, I have a hard time believing he comes back unless the Jays really do want to pay him either way. At the end of the day, based on his current numbers, he is going to be getting paid. He's lined up to be getting paid, but do you think there's a chance that the Jays attempt to extend him during this season? Or do you think he completely walks or not even walks? He just, I guess, tests the market and then 
perhaps goes elsewhere, maybe comes back. But I, I do find that interesting as um, as we head into June now. And after the month he put up, he's definitely one of the candidates to win uh, AL Player of the Month for sure. I think it entirely depends on him, whether he yeah. comes back or not. Like, I don't think it's – like, if he wants to come back, I think the Blue Jays would be glad to have him. But Do you think I the think Jays just, make an offer, though? I Well, I think at the very least they make a qualifying offer. Yeah. Like, that's yeah. just a no-brainer because then you get a draft pick if he signs out where if he decides to come back for like whatever it is 18 million dollars for the qualifying offer that's a steal so like it's win-win offering qualifying offer but when it comes to an extension or offering him you know a multi-year deal I don't think the Blue Jays are going to go out of their way to offer him an exorbitant amount of money like you said Jacob they have these guys coming up in the organization they just spent all this money on George Springer and I think going forward they're going to be saving money for big name pitchers who are hitting the market, right? There wasn't, besides Trevor Bauer, there wasn't really that top tier guy on the market this last off season for the Blue Jays to go out and sign. But moving forward, there's going to be increasing depth in the free agent market at that position. I think they're going to want to spend there. I don't think they're going to want to spend on someone like Marcus Simeon, who represents an area of organizational, organizational strength. So I think if the opportunity presents itself, if, Marcus Simeon wants to come back. They'll try to make something happen, but I don't think it's going to be a priority. Mm -hmm. If they can get him, maybe like you said, a qualifying offer, something, maybe if they want to give him 20 mil, something like that, which is two more that two more million than what he's on right now, then I would gladly take him. But I, I think what you said makes sense. It depends on if he wants to come back, but I think it also depends on the prospects. If the Blue Jays or the status of them, really, if they want to bring them up or, or if they think that, Austin Martin or Jordan Groshans have a chance at coming up next year, then maybe they don't make an offer to Simeon. I mean, there's obviously that's a lot of a, of pressure put on them. And that's a big gamble to say you're coming up and you're going to be our starting, whatever second baseman, shortstop, third baseman, something like that. That's a lot of pressure put on them. And I don't think that would happen, but if Simeon's with the team, then that would probably just prolong their, minor league career the way I see it I mean maybe they come up and they're a platoon player or they they sit on the bench and come out every couple days but yeah if if the opportunity does present itself then I would gladly gladly take it but I think it depends on a lot of factors and also I mean the season's just barely begun I mean oh not barely but it's it's two months in so there is still a performance that Simeon's gonna have to put up if in order to make that payday but all uh, all signs are showing that he's gonna do it so if the opportunity presents presents itself, I'm glad and I'd gladly take him. But it's going to depend on a lot of things that we'll, we'll have to watch throughout the season. And you guys are talking about the free agent market. Another question, and it's going to come up, and it's going to come up soon. And a lot of people are wondering: Should this have maybe been done a few years ago? The extensions or the eventual payday for somebody like Vladimir Guerrero Jr. It's coming. We all know it is. Tatis is signed. Acuna signed. I mean, should the Jays have maybe banked on him a couple of years ago? And obviously it would have been a lot lower than what it would be now because Vladimir Guerrero Jr. is on par for a pretty big payday and that's going to have to be addressed as well in the future. So maybe that also affects the status of Simeon or Simeon, sorry. But uh, yeah, I mean, either way, what a week he had. And some other notables as well. You know, Rowdy Telez was somebody I thought um, as much as we, the, what, the five games this past week, somebody that really played well, a home run, one RBI and an OPS over 1200 this past week. Somebody like Raddy Telez staying or starting to get hot. Randall Gritchick as well, an OPS over uh, 1200 this week as uh, two with three RBIs and one home run. And the one who's been leading the team, I don't know if you guys are aware, but his name is Joe Panic, leading the team with an OPS of over 1400 this past week. I'm just saying somebody like him is, is a pretty good addition for him to start going, contributing, obviously, for the bottom of the order. But, yeah, these guys as well, definitely a good week out of these guys for sure. But we'll see what happens as we head into the month of June. And you hope somebody like Simeon, who we are expecting the production to stay with, hopefully it continues as well. And we all know the story of Guerrero, Bichette, and uh, Teoscar Hernandez is another guy that has been a notable all month long. Yeah, Joe Panic really killed Cleveland this week. <laughs> like he had that four hit game, including a home run. And then in on the, the double too. header, he had it. Yeah. yeah. In the cold, like you the ball wasn't was freezing. flying at all. Like the ball yeah. was very dead because it was not warm weather. And still he got a deep home run. It wasn't a cheap, it wasn't a wall scraper. It was deep into the, the, the right field bleachers. So yeah, it was a crazy week 
for him. Um, when it comes to extending Vlad and Bo, I think that's a conversation for another day. Maybe you kind of buy low on Bichette right now because he's not hitting so well yeah. this season. Um, but Vlad, like he's going to be really expensive. You're looking at Fernando Tatis Jr., Francisco Lindor, uh, Ronald Cunha yeah. Jr. You're looking at that type of money. So I don't know. We'll see. I agree with you. But, yeah. I got to say one more thing. I also want to uh, say one more thing. Okay. Okay. But, yeah, so you bef- go. Before I'll go first. This is off topic, completely off topic. Hopefully, if anybody's listening to this after Monday, and maybe if they're listening today, Hopefully the Maple Leafs are in the second round. <laughs> if you guys are listening to this the next day after Monday, it's another stressful day as much as we saw the Jays or yesterday. That's another thing to look forward to now tonight. Just uh, what a weekend for uh, Toronto sports. That's all I have to say. Very stressful everywhere. Just no matter what sport it's been, it's been stressful. <laughs> yeah, I was lose... going to say something. Oh, mm-hmm. Go ahead, Jacob. I was going to say, if they lose, I'm probably going to hibernate until God knows when, because I, I bet, I bet kid. This is off topic, but I've been around for this entire competitive window and I cannot take another series loss in the first round. Moving on be- before I pass out. Okay. I was going to say something a little bit more on topic. I was going to say that the Blue Jays off season, this off season may kind of be shaping up to look like the San Diego Padres last off season, kind of going all out, right? You, you could have... You could have the extensions of some of these young guys at the same time that they go out on the free agent market and get some top tier pitchers. Could be pretty exciting, but anyways, that's down the line. We we really Same. got away with the <laughs> off the topic from this week. So a rough season series for Charlie Montoyo, but hopefully heading into Buffalo, we get to play Miami. Hopefully we're ending this week with a little bit more of a cheerful topic. But anyways, thank you to everyone who listened to this episode. As always, you can find us on social media at section 138 pod. You can stay up to date with everything we're doing there. You can watch our episodes on YouTube and stay up to date for some live streams. We're on YouTube as well. Um, You can support our podcast on Patreon. It's patreon.com slash section 138 pod. And then lastly, you can rate and review our podcast on Apple Podcasts, which just helps spread the word about what we're doing here. Okay, it was one heck of an episode this week, but we'll catch you next week.